Hi everyone, this is the final lesson that we are going to have on renal physiology. We are going to complete our discussion of this organ system by finally wrapping up our, uh, our talk on regulating mean arterial blood pressure. Uh, in our last lesson together, uh, we talked about how the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate, is maintained within uh, a fairly narrow range as long as the blood pressure of the body is relatively normal. That is between uh, about 180 and 80 millimeters of mercury, um, your GFR is going to remain relatively constant. And so even if you are uh, running or stressed out or whatever, um, or you are laying on the couch and so your blood pressure is super low and you're nice and relaxed, um, your GFR is going to be relatively the same no matter what. And this is of course regulated within the kidneys themselves so that we make just the right uh, amount of urine based on the needs of the body. Our uh, blood contents are exactly where we want them to be. Um, and of course, we don't damage those very delicate glomerular membranes. Um, so today we are going to uh, talk about how we use the kidneys and can kind of override what the kidneys are doing to save the body. Okay, so we're going to talk about the central or extrinsic controls of GFR and what happens when our mean arterial blood pressure is going to increase or de decrease outside of those um, normal ranges. Uh, we are going to talk about the opposite to dehydration, and that's called hypotonic hydration. Uh, we'll talk about how we can use pharmaceuticals um, and, either, and also um, some dietary choices to modify urine output and consequently our blood pressure. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about how we get rid of all that urine and finally get into those different types of, or those different organs within the urinary system. Okay, so uh, we have seen this graph before. Uh, the intrinsic control mechanisms are really important in maintaining GFR um, from moment to moment. Okay, so we need to maintain GFR around 125 milliliters per minute. Um, and even if you are running or relaxing um, and you know your diastolic pressure being way down here as well, um, your GFR is going to remain constant. Now if your GFR is, or sorry, if your mean arterial blood pressure is super high, so hypertension, um, or if it drops really low, um, so you are hemorrhaging or you have some other kind of issue regulating your blood pressure, um, we need to override what is going on in the kidney to protect the kidney so that we can prioritize the other organs of our body. That is, it is a more immediate threat to the entire body to have GFR maintained here um, if um, the blood pressure is way too high or way too low. Okay, so um, the two mechanisms of central control, the ones that have the ability to override the GFR based on the needs of the body, are the nervous system, of course, as well as the endocrine system. Okay. We know uh, from our discussions of the cardiovascular system that there are a few blood vessels in our body that uh, contain what are called baroreceptors. Baroreceptors detect the pressure, um, and so these are actually embedded within the carotid arteries as well as in within the aortic arch. Um, and so both of these places or receptors in these places can detect low mean arterial blood pressure. Right? So a drop below 80 millimeters of mercury. Um, we know that these receptors are actually neurons, and the neurons are going to relay messages via action potentials all the way up to the brainstem. The specific region of the brainstem that is responsible for initiating or launching a response to fix this problem of low blood pressure um, is uh, the medulla oblongata. Right? So if the blood pressure is too low, we of course want to increase it, which uh, division of the autonomic nervous system is responsible for increasing blood pressure? Well, the uh, sympathetic division. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight response, and we desperately need to increase GFR as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And so uh, the sympathetic response, as we know from previous discussions, is of course going to increase our heart rate, right, which is going to increase our blood pressure just a little bit. Um, it is going to directly and immediately stimulate systemic vasoconstriction, Right, so same volume of blood in a smaller space, and therefore that's going to increase pressure in the short term. Um, also, the sympathetic nervous system uh, 
does control the uh, the blood vessels within the kidneys. Okay, so the sympathetic neurons can release norepinephrine onto the tunica media cells of the efferent arterial. Okay, so all these words that we've learned throughout the semester finally culminate into this larger picture story here. Um, so the sympathetic neurons are going to stimulate vasoconstriction of the efferent arterial. Okay, and so uh, in our last lesson together, I used a um, uh, an analogy, right? So we have a sink, right, with a faucet allowing water to come in. That is the efferent arterial. Um, also, there's a drain, the e, or sorry, this is the afferent arterial, and the drain would be the efferent arterial. Okay, and so we can regulate how quickly blood slash water in this case is draining out of the sink versus coming into the sink. And essentially anything that is overflowing out the side of the sink um, is the glomerular filtration, right? So it's the filtrate that is going to enter into uh, the renal tubule to be modified by the nephron. Um, and so vasoconstriction of the efferent arterial is essentially going to plug up this drain Okay. Therefore, there's still plenty of blood or fluid coming into the sink, but now more is going to come out of the sink. Okay. Um, and finally, the sympathetic neurons can also directly stimulate the JG cells. We know that the JG cells are part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. They are normally a part of um, regulating GFR to be 125 no matter what. But the sympathetic neurons can stimulate them to release renin and therefore produce a systemic response to low blood pressure. Remember, the body cares much more about low blood pressure. Okay. Um, and so when renin is released by the JG cells or the granular cells, whatever we're going to talk or whatever you want to call them, um, it is released in response to, of course, the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, and I can tell you that the sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine, so adrenaline or adrenaline, onto the JG or granular cells on beta-1 adrenergic receptors. And so I want to emphasize the beta part here. We're going to come back to that here in just a moment. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system can trigger renin to be released. Um, we also know that a uh, reduced stretch of the JG cells, right, as a result of lower systemic blood pressure is going to automatically trigger the JG cells to release renin. Um, and the macula densa cells, which we know from a previous lesson together, um, they are regulating salt content within the distal convoluted tubule. And if um, the salt content indicates that uh, blood pressure is too low, essentially they tell the JG cells surrounding the afferent arterial to release renin. All right, so clearly renin is a really big deal. We have not one, not two, but three different mechanisms of triggering the release of this hormone from the JG cells. All right, so the fact that we have so many backup plans, so many different things that we modify to make sure that this is released indicates that renin is a really big deal. Right, and we know that from previous lessons. Um, so renin, as we know, um, is going to act on angiotensinogen. Right, angiotensin angiotensinogen is a protein that's made by the liver, just like so many other proteins that end up in the plasma. Um, and it is going to change the shape of this molecule, this protein, into angiotensin 1. Now, angiotensin 1 is not terribly active in fixing this low blood pressure problem. Okay. So um, the next thing that has to happen is ACE in your lungs, right? Angiotensin converting enzyme um, is going to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Um, and just as a side note, not exam worthy or anything, but um, ACE2 receptors um, are what COVID-19 viruses bind to, and that's how they actually invade your cells, right? So the fact that ACE is just so important for regulating your blood pressure uh, means that um, they are all over the place in your body, and you can have a lot of cardiovascular issues, um, which we're seeing, if cells that are equipped with these receptors are infected by a virus and essentially hijacked um, to do the virus's work instead of the cell's work. 
Okay, so again, completely uh, irrelevant to the exam, but just trying to make connections to the real world here. Um, very interesting examples of biology happening in the world today. Um, but what I'm trying to get at here is that angiotensin II, as we know from um, a previous discussion in this class, this is a wildly active hormone throughout the body. And so um, we've taken a look at this uh, image before. I definitely encourage you to um, watch the entire video um, I think it is excellent uh, and just pulls together so many different things. I'll definitely give you that link. Um, but um, for now, it's a great summary of the many different things that angiotensin II is responsible for. All right, so once ang2 is created, which involves renin, right, it involves ACE, right? Without either of those, we don't get ang2. So systemic vasoconstriction is directly stimulated by angiotensin II. And so this is a hormone. It's circulating in the blood. It's going to take a little bit of time to actually produce this vasoconstriction. But once it does, that vasoconstriction is going to last for a lot longer. Okay, so, um, all right, so the vasoconstriction is going to immediately increase mean arterial blood pressure. And we also know that um, angiotensin II is going to stimulate the adrenal gland okay, to release aldosterone. Um, when we talked about the cardiovascular system, I just told you that aldosterone is going to help you get rid of some more, or sorry, uh, is going to help you retain more water. Um, now we know from our discussion of renal physiology that aldosterone is essentially going to cause more epithelial sodium channels to be inserted in the membranes of your distal convoluted tubule and your collecting duct based on the needs of the body, right? The body has a super low blood pressure and so we need to fix that. How do we do that? We're going to reabsorb more salt, right? Specifically more sodium out of the filtrate and back into the blood. All right, we also insert more sodium potassium pumps into these same facultative regions of our millions of nephrons within the kidneys. Okay, and so why the heck do we care so much about salt? I thought the problem was the blood pressure being too low. Well, the reason why we need salt is because we need to essentially uh, create a concentration gradient for water to follow, right? And that's all well and good, as long as we also have channels for water to be reabsorbed. Okay, so aldosterone is sticking some sodium channels and pumps into the DCT and the collecting duct membranes. Therefore, we reabsorb more salt back in the body. Water, of course, follows salt. And so water is going to be pulled back into the blood, right? Therefore, increasing blood volume from the filtrate. Right? Um, but this only works, right? We can only actually utilize this concentration gradient as long as we also have. ADH. All right, remember, ADH is antidiuretic hormone. It is also stimulated by um, angiotensin II. Okay, so that is going to trigger the posterior pituitary gland, all right, the, uh, the bottom of your brain, to release ADH into the blood. ADH is then going to insert more aquaporins into the DCT and the collecting duct. Um, and I add <laughs> this little picture down here um, because I want to point out something that um, I see students, students get confused about every year and I want to um, try to prevent that and you guys I want to help you understand this as much as possible even though it's super complex. Um, think of the water in the boat as the filtrate, right? This was made at some, at some time water came into the boat and so essentially it came into the tubule, right, um, at the filtration membrane. Um, if we want or if we need to reabsorb water, which we always do to some extent, um, we can insert aquaporins, right? So water channels into the membrane, essentially reabsorb that water from the filtrate back into the blood. And so when we release ADH, essentially what that's doing is adding more buckets, right? So ideally, um, with ADH, you're going to have one out one bucket, but two or three or four buckets Right? And so what that's doing is it's taking more water from in the filtrate, from in the boat, and putting it back into the blood, back into the rest of the body. And so, consequently, if you have more ADH, therefore more buckets, in theory, you should have less 
urine output, right? There's going to be less water in the boat. So there's going to be less filtrate and less urine because we have reabsorbed so much back from the filtrate into the body, or in this case, the body of water. Okay. So blood volume and urine volume are going to be opposite. They're going to be inversely proportional as one goes down, right? The filtrate level goes down the blood volume is going to go up. And that's exactly what angiotensin II is trying to do in this situation. We are trying to take water out of the filtrate and put it back into the body so that we increase the volume of the blood. Higher blood volume is going to increase the blood pressure enough to actually deliver blood to all of our tissues and need. Okay, as blood volume increases, filtrate volume is going to decrease. Um, so again, um, those, you know, this goes up, that goes down has been um, troublesome for students in the past. And so um, I hope that this extra teeny analogy um, may reach you and may help to um, let you understand this. Okay. Um, also, angiotensin II is going to stimulate the hypothalamus in other ways. Specifically, it is going to activate the thirst center. Okay. So now we're not only um, taking water back out of the filtrate, but also maybe it's raining, right? So more water is being added to the body um, as an input, okay? Um, finally, uh, right, the goal here is to increase GFR, okay? So the GFR has dropped dangerously low, and so that's really bad. We can't have that. And so um, angiotensin II is going to further, and in a more long-term way, constrict the efferent arterial. Okay, and so again, that's plugging the drain on the sink. Therefore, there's going to be a more volume coming over the side of the sink, and therefore GFR is restored for the needs of the body. Okay, um, all right, so, uh, in our last lesson together, we talked about how autoregulation, right, these intrinsic control mechanisms are generally maintaining GFR and they can do this completely without um, the endocrine system or the nervous system stepping in. However, if those mechanisms are insufficient to restore GFR back to normal, we of course need the central control mechanisms. Um, these are initiated by low blood pressure. Okay, so that's the problem. We want to fix it by increasing the blood pressure. So we're going to increase GFR again. Um, and also stress. Remember that the sympathetic nervous system um, is going to purposely raise your mean arterial blood pressure. Um, and of course, that is um, hoping to help you have a high enough blood pressure to be able to run away from a bear, right? Um, so um, stressful situations uh, are going to purposely override what the kidney thinks is best for itself so that the entire body can get out of a sticky situation if necessary. And so just to summarize, um, this is the other half of a chart I showed you the other day. Um, so the JGA um, is going to release renin um, through whatever mechanism, right? So because the sympathetic neurons tell it to do so with those beta-1 adrenergic receptors, the macula densa tell it, cells tell it to, or they detect less stretch. Okay, so renin is going to trigger ANG1, right, the formation of ANG1 from a liver protein. ANG1 is going to be converted into ANG2 by ACE, okay, um, and ANG2 is the really active one, and so ANG2 is going to cause vasoconstriction, okay, and, right, further constriction of the efferent arterial, so hopefully increasing that GFR back up to normal. I also, ANG2 is going to trigger more aldosterone. We know that aldosterone is going to increase sodium retention, therefore in generating a concentration gradient, which water can follow. So an osmotic pool of water back into the lake from the boat. Okay. Um, angiotensin II is also going to trigger a lot of responses within the nervous system, specifically from the hypothalamus, um, and it's going to increase sympathetic motor tone, right? that is more cardiac output, right? So higher uh, heart rate, higher contractility of the heart. Um, it can trigger a uh, constriction of the venous reservoirs, right? So remember, um, veins are 
and capacitance vessels at any given moment, there's about 50% of your blood volume within the veins, right? So not in the heart, not in the arteries, but in the veins because um, there's such low pressure conduits and the blood kind of is moving along so slowly that at any given point, most of your blood is actually in the veins. Um, the veins do, however, have a nice tunica media, thinner albeit, but a tunica media nevertheless. And so the uh, nervous system can trigger a constriction of the tunica media in your veins, therefore generating pressure in your veins to mobilize as much volume, as much blood as possible, right? Therefore increasing the blood volume and hopefully bringing GFR back up to normal. Okay, so we can uh, mobilize that extra blood, make it actually move along a lot faster if we need it. And so in this case, when GFR has plummeted super low because your blood pressure has plummeted super low, we can increase the volume of blood in our arteries by getting it out of the veins. Okay, um, the or NG2 can stimulate thirst, right? So more fluid is coming into your body, therefore increasing blood volume again. Um, and of course, ADH is, you know, adding more buckets, right? So we can get water out of the filtrate into the blood and therefore further increase blood volume. And so hopefully with increased blood pressure because of vasoconstriction and increased blood volume, collectively, this is going to increase GFR, right? And hopefully help the rest of the body. Okay. Um, so this is a nice summary of the many different things that ANG2 is responsible for doing, again, to increase, to fix the problem of low blood pressure. All right, so let's just uh, talk about a little uh, question here before we move along. Okay. Um, in response to high blood pressure, the kidneys will what? All right, so will they produce a small volume of dilute urine? Well, first of all, let's think um, high blood pressure, right? Um, so this essentially means that we have too much blood volume, right? And so the way to get rid of blood volume is to leave it in the boat, right? Is to let it go out with the wash. And so instead of reabsorbing water here, Right. Everything from here over is going to happen no matter what, unless there are drugs involved, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But if we want to decrease the blood pressure, we don't want to reabsorb water. We want to let that extra volume of water go out. Right? So we don't want to produce a small volume of urine right? um, in general, whether it is dilute or concentrated. Uh, and so... Um, I do want to talk for a moment about the small volume of concentrated urine here. Um, generally, if we are reabsorbing a lot of water, there's still kind of the same amount of solutes left over behind, right? And so now we would have the same number of solutes, the same number of molecules diluted by fewer water molecules. And so generally, if you're making a small volume of urine, you are making it pretty concentrated, right? So this would be um, a scenario. Um, the other scenario is a large volume of dilute urine. Right? And so this one is actually the correct one. Um, if we want to get rid of blood volume so we can decrease the blood pressure, we want to let that extra water go out, right? And so therefore we will have a large volume Right, and specifically dilute urine because um, more water molecules with the same number of solutes is going to be very diluted. Okay, so the correct answer here is C. Um, and so uh, D here, reabsorb more water from the filtrate, right? So this would actually produce this scenario, right? A small volume of concentrated urine, right? Um, because we have bucketed out more of that water from the boat and back into the body, so there would be less urine, more blood. Okay, okay so um, let's move along here. Um, what happens when our blood pressure is too high? And as we know, um, the body puts a lot more effort into increasing the blood pressure than it does decreasing the blood pressure. But let's finally wrap up this high blood pressure conversation. Um, we know that the heart um, is kind of the most stressed out, right, is impacted the most by high blood pressure. 
And so um, the heart is therefore the one that is going to release atrial from the atria, natriuretic. So Na for sodium, uretic in the urine peptide. A and P is the hormone that is actually going to reduce the blood pressure. Okay. Um, of course, the blood pressure at which ANP is actually reduced can change, right? So if you have chronic hypertension, the target set point is actually going to shift. And so ANP might be re released at a higher and higher and higher blood pressure. And so it's not actually helping you anymore. And so this is when you would have to um, make some serious lifestyle changes and or take some medication. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Okay. Um, so more stretch in the atria is going to indicate that blood pressure is increased, right? AMP is going to be released. And as we can see, AMP has a lot of different effects on the body. First of all, it's going to put the brakes on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, right? So pretty much all the things that we just talked about with the RAS are going to be suppressed, right? So um, the JG apparatus of the kidney is going to be inhibited, right? So there's going to be less renin. With less renin, there's less angiotensin too. With less ang2, we don't have all sorts of things, right? So there's less vasoconstriction, which essentially means vasodilation, okay? Also, there's less sodium and water reabsorption, right? Because less aldosterone and less ADH is going to trigger the uh, reabsorption of these. So now there's going to be um, Uh, these things are not going to be reabsorbed into the blood, so it's reducing the blood volume and hopefully, therefore, reducing the blood pressure, right? The other thing, the other um, factor here, right, if these things aren't being reabsorbed, this is going to increase the urine, okay? So increase the volume of the urine. And we also know that AMP um, can uh, actually directly suppress um these different organs. So it's not just eliminating, eliminating angiotensin II, but also it is putting the brakes on the hypothalamus and posterior pituitary, so less ADH directly. Also the cortex is uh, suppressed, and so aldosterone is going to be eliminated directly as well. Okay. Um, AMP can also inhibit the collecting ducts of the kidney. So these can actually take out the aquaporins and sodium channels to make sure that we don't reabsorb all that salt and water. Okay, so any way it possibly can, AMP is trying desperately to get your uh, blood pressure back down. And I also want to point out that it uh, both vasodilates the afferent arterial, so turning up the faucet, um, and it vasoconstricts the efferent, right? So this is doing all sorts of different things. Um, so it is turning up the spigot, the faucet and plugging up the drain and therefore we have tons and tons and tons of fluid coming over the side of the sink, right, which is essentially coming into the renal tubules. As a result, this filtrate is going to flow so quickly, right, there's physically not enough time to reabsorb um, even as much as we need, right, so even in the facultative portions of um, of the renal tubule, we're not going to get as much water and sodium retention or reabsorption back into the body um, because the filtrate is just zipping through those structures and immediately going out the wash. Okay, so um, previously we saw that, uh, that we increase the GFR to get it back up to normal. In this situation, we are drastically increasing the GFR so that we can't reabsorb what we need to, right? So it's over a threshold that, you know, we just want to get it out of our body as quickly as we can, right? So um, we excrete a lot more sodium because we're not reabsorbing it. And there's a lot more urine here, right? So lots and lots more water is excreted, okay? Um, there are some other hormones that play a role here. Um, estrogen um, can actually increase sodium reabsorption, so it acts kind of like aldosterone. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why there's often water retention um, at different points during the menstrual cycle as well as during pregnancy. Um, to further complicate this process, progesterone, which is another hormone that's super important in both pregnancy and menstruation, 
um, it is literally pro-gestation or pro-pregnancy, um, this decreases sodium reabsorption, right? And so it's promoting sodium and water loss. Um, and so um, the tug of war between these two hormones is intense. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, what these hormones are actually doing in the next and final section of this class. And finally, glucocorticoids. Remember that this is, um, these include cortisol, the stress hormone. Um, and so the stress hormone, cortisol, is going to increase water re or sodium reabsorption, therefore increasing water retention and increasing your blood pressure in the long term. Okay, so uh, one of the reasons why cortisol is going to increase your blood pressure, not just in this moment, but for the next few days and then some, um, is because it promotes sodium reabsorption. Um, from your kidneys. Okay. Um, all right, so that's the end of blood pressure um, at last. Um, knowing all of those different details that we began to talk about in the cardiovascular system um, is going to be really important in your upcoming exam. Okay. Um, the next uh, kind of scenario that I want to talk to you guys about is called hypotonic hydration. Um, we talked about dehydration, so not drinking enough water. Um, or not being able to keep enough water within your body. Um, and so hypotonic hydration is essentially drinking too much water, so water intoxication, um, or um, some kind of issues with your kidneys where um, you cannot excrete water appropriately. Okay, um, and so uh, let's see, this is uh, taken from the video that I showed you in our last lesson together. We are shooting for 300 milliosmoles per liter. So that's the concentration of all of our bodily fluids. And that is um, going to maintain an equilibrium between inside our cells and outside of our cells. If we um, are dehydrated, right, essentially our extracellular fluid becomes super concentrated and essentially the water is going to move from, um, or it's going to move to dilute that super concentrated fluid. And so water is going to come from inside of our cells and it's going to dilute the extracellular fluid, which of course is um, losing water, um, you know, via diarrhea, via uh, sweating, right? Any of these types of things are losing water and therefore your cells are ultimately going to compensate for that, okay? So all the way to the right, that is um, dehydration. This situation is when the extracellular fluid is too dilute, right? So you have had so much water, okay? So um, if you're drinking a gallon or two water or a gallon or two of water a day and you're not um, sweating out or breathing out as much water um, as that, um, essentially your water inputs are drastically exceeding your water outputs. And so what that does is it dilutes the extracellular fluid. So maybe now it's down to 100, okay? Um, so hyponatremia, so this is a hypotonic solution, right? So always relative to our cells, hypotonic, less tonicity, less solutes than inside of our cells. Um, and so the net osmosis into our tissue cells or the net osmosis is then going to go into our tissue cells. Um, and so um, this diagram down here at the bottom is showing us how um, too much water inputs, right, um, is going to dilute the concentration of your solutes in your blood, in your interstitial fluid, okay, as opposed to in your cells. Okay, and so water then is going to try to um, essentially dilute that area of higher concentration. And so water is then going to flow into your cells via those aquaporins, um, causing them to swell, All right? This drastically affects the chemical reactions of your cells. So drastic metabolic disturbances. Um, this can lead to nausea or vomiting, um, cramping of your muscles. Remember that we always need to maintain the appropriate concentration gradients and this um, excess water really is going to throw that off. Um, and um, ultimately, when water is coming into your tissue cells, it's causing edema, 
right? So swelling. Um, and so that might not seem like such a huge deal um, in your feet or in your extremities. Um, but when you start thinking about cells taking on water in places that don't really have enough room to expand, uh, for example, your brain, right? Cerebral edema. Um, your skull is super close to your brain. And so if your brain cells start taking on fluid because of having too much um, fluid in your extracellular environment, um, this can cause swelling of your brain, which of course cannot expand very much. We know that our cerebral cortex, the part that actually lets us think consciously and make these big executive decisions is right on the outside of our brain. And so that's going to start pushing into your skull. Obviously that's not ideal. And there have been um, instances of mortality uh, due to this cerebral edema. It's so obviously not ideal either. Um, essentially, you want to kind of Goldilocks all the good things, right? Not too much, not too little, just the right amount. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk to you guys about today is how we can purposely decrease mean arterial blood pressure. Um, again, I've said this so many times before, but the body cares most about low blood pressure. We in our society um, consciously care more about decreasing high blood pressure. Right? And there are a lot of different uh, factors that go into increasing um, the development of hypertension in our society, right? Stress and diet and lifestyle, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, here, let us very briefly talk about a couple of ways that we can treat high blood pressure. Um, so the first uh, kind of class of drugs that I want to talk about, um, or minimally chemicals that I want to talk about, are called beta blockers. Remember that beta adrenergic receptors bind to noradrenaline or norepinephrine. Um, so this is the neurotransmitter released by the sympathetic nervous system. We know that the sympathetic nervous system is designed to increase blood pressure, increase heart rate. And so if we block those beta adrenergic receptors, we can uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, we can decrease. We, uh, we can decrease the heart rate. Right. Um, we can decrease the contractility. Um, we can change essentially how quickly um, those messages are being sent from the atria to the ventricles. Right. And now we know that there are beta adrenergic receptors on the efferent arterial as well as on the JG cells of the juxtaglomerular apparatus of our uh, nephrons. So by blocking the beta receptors, we can directly decrease blood pressure in the short term by decreasing heart rate and decreasing uh, vessels, vessel diameter, et cetera. But also we can change the GFR to ultimately decrease mean arterial pressure in the relatively longer term. And so all beta blockers um, end in OLOL. So pro propanolol, um, for example, is a beta blocker. Okay. Um, also, we can enhance urinary output. And as I said, the more urine volume you have, the less um, blood volume you have, right? If you're saving more blood volume, you're getting rid of more. Or if you're saving more blood, you are not getting rid of as much urine, right? Um, so there's a class of chemicals that essentially enhance urinary output, and these are most definitely not all pharmaceuticals, right? Not at all. Um, so these are, these can be simply any kind of substance that increases your urinary output. So it essentially is going to remain in the filtrate, and the higher and higher concentration of this stuff that you have in your filtrate the more water is going to remain in the filtrate and go out in your urine. Um, so for example, we talked about uh, glucose with diabetes mellitus, right? Uh, so if your blood sugar is so high that it exceeds the transport maximum of your nephrons, essentially glucose is going to remain in the filtrate when normally it wouldn't. And so this solute is going to exert an osmotic pull. It's going to be pulling water back into the filtrate, therefore going out in the urine, as opposed to coming back into the body. Okay, so um, glucose in this case would be a diuretic. Um, also, uh, we can, um, you know, drink 
uh, coffee and tea and soda and all those things are ultimately osmotic diuretics. So that's why um, you urinate so much when you drink lots of coffee. Um, also on that note, um, ca the caffeine in coffee um, in, is mostly what is actually making it a diuretic. And the reason for that is that it actually inhibits the reabsorption of sodium. Okay. Um, generally, the different things that we consume can change how much water stays versus goes. Um, so on the other side of this coin, um, so not something, not a diuretic, not something that's decreasing MABP, um, but eating lots of salty foods um, is adding lots of salt to your blood essentially. And so you end up exerting even more of an osmotic pull back into your blood and out of your urine. And so you can actually retain water, right? And ultimately increase your blood pressure if you're eating lots of salt. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, no matter what you're eating and drinking, you can change what's happening in your kidney, whatever's happening in your body. Um, one other one that I want to mention, um, alcohol acts as a diuretic, right? So alcohol goes through pretty quickly, right? Lots and lots of volume of uh, urine. In fact, a larger volume of urine than the alcohol that you consumed. And the reason for that is that alcohol inhibits ADH. And so if it's inhibiting antidiuretic hormone, you are not inserting as many buckets, right? So you're not bucketing out as much of that filtrate back into the body of water. Um, it's going to stay in the boat and therefore go out with the wash. Okay. Um, all right. A couple more examples here. Um, there are some pharmaceutical diuretics, um, and there are so many different diuretics um, that are acting on different parts of the nephron um, and have all sorts of different side effects and everything. But I want to introduce you to just a couple today um, in a very uh, hopefully straightforward, simple way. Um, loop diuretics um, are uh, very powerful. Um, so they are essentially blocking the uh, water reabsorption from here, right? And they can do that by essentially blocking these channels or blocking these channels, right? So no water, no salt. Um, and so if the loop of Henle is not reabsorbing that substantial volume of water, there's going to be more water that leaves, right? So it is a diuretic. Um, also, ACE inhibitors, right? ACE inhibitors, um, ACE starts, oops, starts with A, right? like April, and so the ACE inhibitors all end with oh, uh, pril, right? So captopril, seropril, um, these are ACE inhibitors. And so uh, remember that ACE is necessary for converting angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Ang2 is fantastically powerful at increasing your blood pressure. And so if we don't have ANG2, we don't have ADH, we don't have aldosterone, right? We don't have vasoconstriction, right? All of these different things are going to be inhibited just by inhibiting one single substance, and that is ACE. Okay, um, so ACE obviously, or ACE inhibitors obviously are incredibly powerful. They kind of block the effects of angiotensin II entirely. Um, we could also be a little bit more direct by blocking ANG2 as opposed to the thing that makes it. Um, and we can block the aldosterone receptor. Okay, so without the aldosterone re uh, receptor functioning, we don't get as many ENACs, right? So sodium channels, um, and therefore we don't generate as steep of a concentration gradient, so we do not reabsorb as much water. Okay, so um, this diagram here um, is just very simply showing you some of the different places that we can um, play with the nephrons to decrease mean arterial blood pressure. Okay, let's do two questions before we zoom out to look at the entire kidney. Um, Annie has just eaten a lot of french fries pickled eggs and some cheese, a heck of a meal. But what I'm getting at here is that she just had a ton of salt. And so how is this going to affect her physiology? The options here are, it'll cause a prolonged increase in the osmolality of the blood. So essentially um, increasing how much salt is in her blood for a long time. Um, I want to point out that your kidney 
Um, does a great job at regulating the salt and the proteins and the cells and all these different things in your blood um, within very narrow ranges. Um, and so it can actually address these issues fairly quickly. And so yes, she is going to have more salt in her blood. So the osmolality of her blood is going to be increased, but not for a long time, right? Water is always going to move to dilute the salt. And so very quickly, um, she is going to have these fluid shifts, right? Both back out of the filtrate as well as maybe even out of her cells to equalize the osmolality, right? So to um, get the body back to equilibrium. So prolonged is not the case. And there will be a temporary increase in blood volume. So temporary, absolutely, in the blood volume. And so this is absolutely correct. And this is indeed the correct answer. Um, with more salt in the blood, this is going to exert a stronger osmotic pull out of the filtrate and back into the blood. And so her blood volume is going to increase. Remember that aldosterone actually does the same thing, right? So aldosterone increases the amount of salt that goes back into your blood, therefore increasing your blood volume. And so your diet can also do this. So um, if you uh, are personally at risk for hypertension or no family members who are um, dealing with hypertension, um, it's always the advice to reduce your salt intake or eliminate your salt intake. Um, and that is because more salt in your diet means more salt in your blood. More salt in your blood means you're retaining more blood volume. And more blood volume means higher blood pressure. Okay. Um, all right, so the next two answers are incorrect, but let's see why. Um, she'll experience hypotension, and no, this is low blood pressure, and so we know that she's going to ex uh, experience possibly a temporary hypertension. Okay. Um, there'll be a shift in the pH of her body fluids. Um, this isn't affecting her pH, it's affecting her fluid balance. Okay. Um, next, uh, how can an ACE inhibitor such as captopril be effective as an anti-hypertensive? So um, anti against hypertension, um, high blood pressure. So this is essentially saying, how does an ACE inhibitor reduce your blood pressure? Okay, so let's take a look. Um, ACE inhibitors reduce blood pressure, right? and they kind of all say that reduce, 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 very good, um, by causing less A and P to be released. Um, remember that A and P is the one hormone that is actually trying to decrease your blood pressure, just like the ACE inhibitors. So we actually want more A and P, and frankly, ACE inhibitors are not going to be affecting A and P. Okay. Um, ACE inhibitors reduce blood pressure by causing more ADH to be released, resulting in more water output and lowering of the blood volume, which lowers the blood pressure. So um, there's a couple different things going on here. Um, so ACE inhibitors are reducing the blood pressure, yes, by causing more ADH. Remember that ADH is going to increase water coming back into the body, which increases the blood volume therefore increasing the blood pressure. So this is not correct. It's not lowering the blood pressure. It's not, um, or if more ADH would be released, that would increase the blood volume and blood pressure. Okay, um, so B is not correct. A is not correct. So hopefully C is correct. Um, ACE causes less aldosterone and ADH to be released, and that's absolutely true. We know that ACE pretty much puts the brakes on the entire renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, so less aldosterone, less ADH. Therefore, um, we are reabsorbing less water. More water is going out in the urine, so the blood volume is decreased, and therefore the blood pressure is decreased. Right? So a lot of words in that, but we do know the answer. Right, um, just try to break it down to the best of your ability. Right, so ACE inhibitors reduce aldosterone, reduce ADH, so less water comes back into the body, goes out in the urine instead. Okay, so finally we have made the urine and we need to get the urine the heck out of the body. Urine is made at this corticomedullary boundary, so this is where the um, the nephrons would be. Some of them dip deep into the medulla. 
So those are the juxtamedullary and others barely leave the cortex. Either way, nephrons are going to drain their filtrate at this point urine into collecting ducts and the collecting ducts are going to drain collectively into a minor calyx. Right, so we can see at the base of each of these renal pyramids is a like funnel shape that is called a minor calyx or calyces for plural. Um, multiple minor calyces join together to become a major calyx. Okay, so here we can see three minor calyces join together to become a major calyx. Multiple major calyces, so this here, are going to join together to form the renal pelvis. Okay, so the renal pelvis is essentially where all of the urine that's been made in the kidney is going to mix together um, and ultimately exit the kidney out the renal hilum. All right, so this entry slash exit for all of the stuff, right, renal nerves, renal blood vessels, as well as the ureter itself. Okay, so um, urine is going to exit through the renal hilum in the ureter. Right, or your reader, depending on who you're talking to, and is going to be drained down into the urinary bladder. So the ureters are going to convey urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. Right, we can see them here. Um, they are retroperitoneal, so they are outside of the peritoneum, kind of um, held on the posterior um, body wall um, in your abdominal pelvic cavity. Um, but not covered by the serous membrane. Um, right. uh, they do enter the base of the urinary bladder through the posterior wall. So um, this doesn't really show this very well, but they actually come into the back of the urinary bladder and exit um, kind of at the bottom here. Um, and so as the urinary bladder gets more and more full, it's going to exert more and more pressure on those um, orifices, right? And essentially, close them off, preventing urine from flowing back up to your kidneys. Okay, um, Just like with most of the other organs we've looked at, um, the ureters have three different layers to their wall, um, and maybe you've seen these before um, in your uh, AMP1 class, but essentially um, there's the transitional epithelium, right? this kind of like flowery shape here. Um, so this transitional epithelium allows the ureter to stretch and recoil um, depending on whether or not it has urine in it. Um, there is a muscular layer in, um, and essentially whenever this is stretched it is going to contract completely automatically and so this helps um, to push the urine down to the urinary bladder so you can think of this like peristalsis. Um, and the outer adventitia um, so here we can see some adipose, but also um, lots of fibers as well. Okay, um, this is a mid-sagittal section um, of the of the body um, of well, specifically of the abdominal pelvic cavity. So here is the diaphragm. So the lungs are up here. The liver. The stomach held up by the lesser omentum. Here is that lovely greater omentum. Um, and the intestines held up by the mesenteries here. Um, we can see the duodenum is retroperitoneal, right? Um, and what I'm trying to get at here is the urinary bladder. Okay, so the urinary bladder is also retroperitoneal. Pretty much the entire uh, urinary system is not housed or covered by the serous membrane. Okay. The urinary bladder itself also has three layers of, um, of its wall. Um, again, transitional epithelium um, allows uh, this organ to stretch and recoil. Right. Sometimes it's full, sometimes it's less full. Um, and so we need a tissue that is going to uh, accommodate that differing volume and essentially um, not allow leakage between those cells. Okay, so transitional epithelium. Um, next, there is a thick uh, muscle, and this muscle is called the detrusor muscle. Um, so your bladder can contract, essentially increasing pressure and facilitating the flow of urine. Okay, and finally, there's a fibrous adventitia we can see that the peritoneum is only kind of on top, and so your intestines would be up here. Um, 
but the rest just has a fibrous outer coating. Okay. Um, note that the ureters enter into the urinary bladder from behind. Um, and so it might be a little bit difficult to imagine this without models or whatnot, um, but your kidneys are all the way on your back. Your urinary bladder is all the way to the front. So that's right behind your pubic bone. Um, and so the ureters are coming from behind and they're going to enter into or drain urine into the urinary bladder from behind. And so there are um, two orifices, ureteric orifices here, um, where the ureters are going to enter. Okay. Um, now together, these two ureteric orifices, one from each of the kidneys, and the opening into the urethra, right? The urethra is what passes urine out of the body. Ureters pass urine to the bladder. Um, so collectively, these three orifices, these three holes, are going to form a triangle. And so we call this triangle the trigon. Um, if you have a UTI, chances are it is infecting this area right here. And of course, the goal is not let that UTI um, travel up the ureters into your kidneys because that is a much more severe issue. Okay, but either way, um, bacteria that is residing within this trigon um, agitates that transitional epithelium. And so um, you might have a little bit of blood in your urine from an infection right here. Okay. Also, if we take a look inside the urinary bladder, we see that the texture of the walls is not really smooth. In fact, this looks an awful lot like the inside of the stomach. Um, and the reason for that is that um, just like the stomach, right, sometimes the urinary bladder is full and sometimes it's empty. And so um, we need to have a lot of extra room for stretch. And so the transitional epithelium is one way that the bladder does this. The other one is having rugae. Okay. Um, and so it is particularly important for the bladder to have a lot of rugae so that we can increase the volume of the bladder without significantly increasing the pressure. Because the more pressure you have in your bladder, the more urine is going to want to come out of that bladder. Right. Um, so when it is time to void or to eliminate urine from your body, um, urine is going to pass through the urethra. Um, the urethra differs in males and females. Um, and as we'll see in the next section of this class, the male urethra has three different parts. Okay, again, we'll talk about this more later, but um, essentially both male and female urethras are lined with primarily pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Okay, so um, a lot of mucus, remember that um, it's really important to protect our body. This is one of those um, openings to the outside world. And so it is a source or a route of infection. And so we really want to kind of um, trap any invaders on their way in before they can actually infect the body. Um, also, uh, very close to the external urethral orifice, right? So essentially the opening of the urethra itself um, is stratified squamous epithelium. And so the reason for this is that, um, again, this is closest to the outside world. Anywhere we have um, exposure to the outside world is subject to abrasion. And therefore we want to have lots of layers of pretty cheaply made cells so that if they slough off, um, it's no big deal, we have lots more. And we didn't really invest a lot of energy into making those cells. Okay. Um, passage of urine through the urethra is regulated by not one, but two circular muscles. The first one is called the internal urethral sphincter, um, and that is essentially preventing urine from flowing out of the bladder at all. all right, so it's actually right here at pretty much the opening of the urethra itself. Um, this is made of smooth muscle, which means it's involuntary. Right? We have reflexes as I'm about to talk about that determine when this sphincter, circular muscle, is going to open up. And actually this one is a little bit wild. Um, it, uh, when it's relaxed, it's closed, right? And when it's going to open and therefore allow the passage of urine, it contracts, okay? Um, so a little bit different um, and that's a good thing. We really don't want to depend on one single muscle like constantly being clenched up or else 
urine comes out when it's inconvenient, okay? Um, next, the external urethral sphincter. This is the voluntary or skeletal muscle sphincter. Um, this is actually embedded within um, your pelvic floor. All right, so if I go back to the previous slide here, um, this is the pelvic floor, so a muscular layer. Um, and this is a cross-section through that circular muscle. So essentially it would be coming out and around, going behind, right? So all the way around the urethra, okay? Um, so again, this one is voluntary, right? So we have reflexes that regulate when our internal urethral sphincter is going to open up and therefore allow urine to pass out. But in theory, the external urethral sphincter allows us to consciously decide when it is convenient to let urine flow. Okay. Um, before we talk about avoiding itself, um, let me um, play this short clip on kidney stones or renal calculi. Um, so why and what are kidney stones? Ah, theme parks. Don't you just love them? They're great places to eat $12 hot dogs, see countless kids on leashes, and pass kidney stones? Hey peeps, Crystal here for DNews. You may have heard of kidney stones and how painful they are. Chances are a few of you have had to suffer through them already because 10% of people will have a kidney stone at least once in their life. One of those unfortunate souls claimed he passed his stones while riding a roller coaster. Researchers followed up on his claim and found that the bumps and jolts of a roller coaster can help kidney stones make their way through the body with a 64% chance you'll pass the stone. Crazy, right? But what exactly are kidney stones anyway and how do they get in your body? Kidney stones, also known as nephrolithiasis, are small, hard mineral deposits formed in the kidneys that pass the urinary tract and leave the body through the urethra. For those of you that don't know, that's where your pee comes out. They typically occur when some of the minerals in your pee become highly concentrated. See, your urine has over 3,000 different compounds in it, including salts and a wide variety of minerals. When the amount of fluid gets out of balance with the minerals, or when your urine lacks the right substances to break up the minerals, they may clump together, forming a kidney stone. One of the most common types is formed when a compound called calcium oxalate becomes highly concentrated. These are aptly named calcium stones. Kidney stones in general vary in shape, texture, color, and size. They can be as small as a grain of sand, as big as a golf ball, smooth, jagged, or even sharp. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely don't want a sharp golf ball sized object coming out of my urethra. Most kidney stones are passed out of the body in a few days, but they can sometimes take weeks. Ouch. These buildups can cause excruciating pain in your side, back and lower abdomen, frequent and painful urination, nausea, and bloody urine. Some people have even said that passing a kidney stone is more painful than childbirth. The amount of pain you'll feel is pretty dependent on the type of stone. Smaller ones can easily be passed with the help of lots of water and some pain medication, but more serious stones may not come out that way. Sometimes they're too big to exit the urethra, and sometimes they're wrecking too much havoc on the kidneys and urinary tract to be left alone. Stones that can't be passed naturally will need to be broken up by shock waves, surgery, or a scope that's inserted up the urethra. So obviously the best thing is to not get these bad boys at all. One of the main causes of the buildups is not drinking enough water, which allows the salts and minerals to build up and stick together. Your diet can also make a difference. Certain foods like spinach, nuts, and chocolate have a high concentration of calcium oxalate. And medical conditions like gout, urinary tract infections, and certain metabolic disorders can increase your likelihood of getting the stones. Even your genetics could play a part because kidney stones can run in families. So if your gramps has had them, be sure to keep an extra eye out for any symptoms. But if you get stuck with them anyway, maybe just take a quick trip to a theme park to speed up the process. So to pass a kidney stone, you have to pee it out. But what happens if you hold in your pee? Check out this video for the answer. See, when your bladder fills up, stretch receptors along your bladder walls send a signal through your spinal cord up into your brain. In response, your brain sends back a reflex signal, telling your detrusor muscle in your bladder to contract, which squeezes your bladder and creates an even stronger stretch reflex. Have you had kidney stones before? Was it as painful as it sounds? Okay, so um, it's a little bit about kidney stones. Um, I played the last portion of the video because I think it's a great transition into the micturition reflex. So this is what actually um, coordinates the process of urination. Um, so uh, the micturition reflex uh, involves both local pathways right um, around the bladder 
as well as sensory reflex pathways. Again, your brain controlling what is um, or when it is convenient to urinate or to void. Okay, so here is the local reflex here. Um, as the video started to say, um, there are stretch receptors within the bladder wall. Okay, um, as your kidneys make more and more urine, um, the bladder is going to get more and more and more full. Therefore, action potentials are going to be sent up the stretch receptors um, to the sacral region of your spinal cord. Okay, so afferent impulses carry to the sacral spinal cord. And this happens when you have about 200 milliliters of urine within your urinary bladder. All right, of course, you can decide, is it convenient to go now or do I have to wait to go? Um, but regardless, this information is going to be relay relayed up to your, um, your spinal cord. And again, this is a reflex. And so this initiates an immediate pre-programmed response. Um, this is actually involving the parasympathetic division of your autonomic nervous system. Um, so this is, again, one of those very few situations where the parasympathetic nervous system enhances or increases the uh, effects on an organ system, right? So again, you don't want to... Um, waste time and energy on digesting. You don't want to waste time and energy on stopping to use the bathroom, right? So defecation, urination are all inhibited by the sympathetic nervous system, but promoted by the rest and digest system, right? It's convenient when, um, when you're resting to go to the bathroom, right? So the parasympathetic motor response is going to, um, stimulate a contraction of the urinary bladder. So these walls are going to contract inwards, therefore increasing the pressure of the urinary bladder. Okay, um, so um, this is the local pathway. The information from the afferent fibers, the stretch receptors, isn't only going to go to the sacral region here, but it's also going to be sent all the way up to your brain. And note that it's going all the way to the cerebral cortex. So we are aware that our bladder is full. We know that we have to pee. We feel it. But the, in theory, the um, urine is not going to be released out of our urethra until we send a message from our brain. Here's the thalamus all the way down our spinal cord to the sacral region. And then finally, Right, we can re relax right, the external urethral sphincter. Right, so both the internal and the external urethral sphincters must be open in order for urine to pass out of the body. Right, remember that um, the urinary bladder is contracted right, because of this um, reflexive pathway, right? Uh, that we talked about before, the central control mechanism. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, this increased pressure in the urinary bladder is going to squeeze out the urine through your urethra. And so here's just the rest of the diagram here for you. Okay. So uh, that is all I have for you today. Thank you guys so much for uh, watching this video. Um, I hope that you have a better understanding of the urinary system at this point. Um, and stay tuned for our uh, discussion on the reproductive system in our next lesson together. Have a great night.